it's, it's not really yeah. good. So nowadays, I mean, breast implants has been a, a highly, you know, a popular procedure. And what's the approximate number per year of women actually undergoing the procedure? So the actually the amount has gone down in the last few years, but the trend in silicone over 20 years is like very like rising. I mean, I think 30 percent over. Don't quote me on that, but uh, roughly 350 to 500 thousand women get breast implants in the United States per year. And that does not include other types of silicone devices like butt implants and chin and jaw and I see. Uh, peck and right, right. penile, you know, that's a thing. Oh and, boy. Yeah. So the product you designed really is helping all these implants, right? Yeah, I hope that anyone who has a silicone device in their body will consider this formula. It's an augment to silicone devices, but my primary focus is breast implants because that's yeah. where, you know, that was like my foundation story and also, I think it's the most popular cosmetic surgery as far as silicone devices. Yeah. Do you have a sense of the how many women that got uh, silicone implant, breast implant, actually have had issues? Well, I can tell you that there are, you know, in recent years, there have been releases of suppressed state like complaints and reports that were given to companies and the FDA. There had been some suppression and there was a whistleblower and there's now archives of these like, you know, just tons and tons and tons of reports and complaints that were kind of like not acknowledged. But the FDA has done a really good job um, in, in the fall of last year, they issued new informed consent for surgeons that is like alerting them, women to, or who, you know, people who got implants about the safety concerns so that they can, you know, consent to them up front. Uh, this has been because women who are not really being counted are coming forward like vocally on social media and through advocacy groups because we, you know, we don't have, we don't really have a system in place to track systemic health concerns because for decades, the medical community has been, uh, you know, suppressing the idea that that's even, and they still are, they're still suppressing the idea that that's even possible. So if they're denying that something is possible, there's no system to track it, which is a big problem, right? Right, right. Um, and the safety studies were never finished. So the companies that presented to the FDA in 2005 or six and got their approval, the FDA asked them to finish these studies that were supposed to be 10-year studies. They were three-year studies, so they had started. And they were supposed to follow the FDA study design, which had been a big failure in the 90s. It wasn't followed, so the FDA was really trying, I believe. But there was not any follow-up, and so the studies were not finished. And now I think that they've been asked to finish, so I'm hoping that that happens. Okay. Yeah. 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 So, what are the range? Uh, it was the range of symptoms that you have, you know, you have studied and found that people, you know, can maybe a lot of people are experiencing symptoms they have no idea it might be related to the implant. Absolutely. So, it's a really complex question to answer because, in essence, we're talking about a person's body's response to basically a. a a negative epigenetic environment. So, and I think, you know, we, you can relate because you, you, you're like one of the healthiest, your lifestyle is one of the cleanest of anyone I know. Like you don't drink alcohol, you know, you're <laughs> doing stem cells regularly. <laughs> <laughs> really? Did you start a little just, bit? Just, you know, there? for the mental health aspect, okay, okay. right? But, you know, community. <laughs> but you, you could talk, and I'm sure you have talked about this, when yes. someone is participating in negative habits, you know, it's, it can change the way their genes are expressing themselves. And sometimes a disease process that wouldn't manifest for later in life can yeah. manifest earlier. So when you have kind of this clouded internal environment that's caused by an onslaught of toxins 24 hours mm. a day, seven days a week, and your body is not getting a break, it's sort of like up to your own body what it's going to look like, how it's going to manifest. Yeah. And, and so it, that could be a little confusing for a clinician to understand, right? clinicians looking at a patient and seeing, okay, well, you have a family history of X, Y, Z, and you're manifesting, it's kind of, you're kind of young yeah. to be manifesting this. Okay. Um, but I can say across the board, there are commonalities. Like we're looking at cases of fibromyalgia in the absence of um, joint, like an obvious joint connective tissue autoimmunity. Like, mm -hmm. you know, they look for those markers and don't find it, yet the patient has fibromyalgia. So it's sort of like, well, okay. what's the cause? Right, um, things like an auto joint and other types of autoimmunity. Uh, anytime a foreign object is put in the body, it can be a trigger event for an autoimmune process. Like right, so um, we're also thinking about swelling and 
brain fog, which is related to gut health, which goes back to the liver and the pathways and the ability to kind of detox these things out. Um, uh, in my case, I had a lot of just pain. And I personally feel that when people have pre-existing heavy metal toxicity, which may or may not be um, causing symptoms, but then they, you know, put in another, like, another thing like breast, breast implants that can be, you know, another another toxic burden on what's an already burdened system, I think that that's when things can really start to manifest, like, in the true nature of that an initial heavy metal. Like, in the case of mercury, it, it's like a central nervous system, you know, attacker, so it can look like hyperreflexia, it can look like MS in the absence of finding MS.